Welcome to Whiskey and Wonder. And welcome in. Hi guys, this is a little bit different than we've ever done before. Yeah. Um, this is uh, this is Whiskey and Wonder. I'm Tyler. I'm Megan. That wherever she is is Megan. <laughs> I am across the city right now, about a 15 minute drive away, recording on my personal computer, which is why I don't sound nearly as pretty as Tyler sounds right I'm, now. I'm not gonna lie, you sound fine. Um, at least through my headphones. Um, well, we'll oh, whoops, see if there's a on. difference. I'm dumb. I forgot to take the starting soon thing off of the video <laughs> record. As you can see, if you're on YouTube now, I've done it. Um, Megan is not in the room with me. I am because not. Because I have tested positive for COVID. So Tyler got on, the Rona, guys. I officially have the Rona. I've been stuck in my house for uh, since Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. So uh, with the exception of leaving to get a COVID test on Tuesday, I've been in my house. Uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody for the support, the well wishes, and everybody that's offered to bring me anything I may or may not need. Definitely. Um, Thank you, guys. Yeah, um, I, I am also it. quarantining. Um, I got a test done. I have not gotten my results back yet. I don't feel sick. I don't have any symptoms. Um, but since me and Tyler are in such close quarters, uh, it was better safe than sorry. So. Yep, absolutely. I'm, um, I am... Our Hanging desk, out at home. Yep. Our desk. Sorry for the awkward pauses. I can't really see her and she can't yeah. see me. So there's no kind of no visual, visual cues. cues to each other. So <laughs> um, it's going to be an interesting day, guys. It is uh, the, just the way we record. You know, we sit about five or six feet apart. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're right at that social distance limit. So, you know, it's just better. Sorry to anybody I may or may not have infected uh, as soon as I started feeling off uh, I went and got tested and started quarantining so um, with that being said uh, neither one of us could go out and get a new whiskey and right. it's one of those things where it was hard neither one of us have uh, either of the same whiskeys at, at our houses at so our house yes we so. couldn't really um, do the same whiskey this week. So we each chose one that we've uh, previously reviewed neat and did it with a whiskey ball. And I bring that up because I have COVID and I'm struggling to smell. I haven't <laughs> lost my sense of smell. I'm just stopped up and hit or miss as to whether I can actually get any scent. I can taste things fine. I can smell things. Just the subtleness of whiskey I can't really smell. I've been trying to smell it. I've already poured mine uh, because I'm trying not to go into the rest of the house for the sake of my roommate. So I had to make a masked trip to the freezer to get a ball, a whiskey, a uh, ice ball. And it's been sitting here for maybe 10 minutes and I can't smell anything in it, but I can smell the slice of pizza that I just ate. Okay. So I can smell. Okay. And I can taste. Oh. Um, kind of. Yeah. Uh, I guess on that note, do you have anything else COVID related you wanted to talk about? COVID related? Um, no, other than keep being safe, be smart. Um, Socially It's distance. not the flu. Social distance, you know, all that fun stuff. It, yeah, it's the weirdest sickness I've ever had, for sure. Uh, I've been feeling pretty good the last two days, but uh, last week, mainly Wednesday through Friday, were up and down. Interesting. It's it's an odd sickness, guys. Um, but anyway, we'll move away from the COVID and we'll go on to talk about our website. Uh, I have done nothing to uh, it. Uh, same. So whiskeyandwonder.com will be our website, is our website, is not currently functioning. Um, yeah, I've just kind of been bedridden for most of the last week. Um, just trying to take it easy. Yep. And I 
I'm not going to lie to you guys. I've been super busy um, starting up a new D&D campaign, and I tried to do more than one person can do in 24 hours. So I had to kind of take stuff as it came. In other words, life happened. Uh, yeah, we will get basically. to it. Yes, ASAP. the website will be made one day soon. Soon. Um, in addition to that, we do have stickers. We are working on uh, t-shirts, and also we've had requests for uh, if you watched our. Uh, wait, no, that was the one I forgot to hit record on. If you have seen the pictures of our decanter and our glasses with our logo on it, uh, that decanter houses the. Uh, whiskey of the year. Whiskey of the year. Yeah. Sorry, COVID. Uh, COVID fog is real, guys. My brain COVID, is. COVID brain is like totally fucking with Tyler. I was, I was about to say uh, the beer of the year, and <laughs> it's, it's not beer. It's whiskey. yeah. No, it's a struggle, y'all. But um, uh, yeah, it's got the whiskey of the year in it. Uh, we're looking at getting those made so that we can sell them to y'all if y'all have any interest. Yes, definitely. We have had a couple people reach out to us and say that they wanted their own whiskey and wonder etched glasses so absolutely that, that tickles me pink as my shirt yes. is um it's, is your shirt pink it is very very it. pink yes um i cannot is, believe i'm missing you wearing a pink shirt it's uh it's got cut off sleeves on it and it's <laughs> uh i gotta figure out how i can turn to the camera here <laughs> uh it's the other side okay it's the it, my uh intramural softball shirt from college in 2013 we were the queen city sluggers Queen City and I was Sluggers. I was the captain. That's why there's a C on my other side. Anyway. Oh, you were the captain. I was because I was the only person on the team that actually knew baseball and knew what they were doing. Oh, well. Um, At least you had fun, I hope. Yeah, I had fun when we actually got to play. Um, okay. The problem was it was co-ed and half the time we didn't have enough chicks to play. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's no fun. But so I just wanted to chit chat about what you know what we've got coming um mm -hmm. you know as far as the website and store and and merchandise and whatnot um i apologize if this is a little bit of a short episode i hope i did the topic uh fuck. justice justice yeah there we go guys <laughs> please forgive me guys this covid brain is no joke um it's a kind of a heavy topic honestly and I and you're doing it during COVID. Do yeah, I researched most of it while I had COVID because you know I had okay. the free time. So all right, um, this is interesting. I'm curious to know what your topic is. All right, so with all that being said, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see all the lovely places you can reach out to us. If you're listening, I'm just going to give you the Instagrams and whiskeyandwonder.com. Uh, Instagram, Megan. I changed it on the YouTube thing. If you guys had a keen eye which apparently I don't. Uh, I had it as Instagram. Instagram. And <laughs> under Megan. And I have since changed that. Uh, her, you can find Megan on Instagram at whiskey.megan. I am at whiskey.tyler. And the podcast itself is at whiskey pod podcast. Um, if you want to see all the other stuff, you can find it in the show notes. It'll be down there. Yep. I'm not saying that yep. full anymore. That's all right. You don't feel good. Um, I am going to throw out our email, whiskeyandwonder at gmail.com. Please email us. Uh, we love having your emails that we can read out loud and hearing what you guys think, whether you hate us, you love us. Let us know. You want to be like us? Yeah. With COVID-19. Hey, I just want to say, I feel like I'm kicking this thing's ass. At least right you now. That is, yes, that is true. You're doing a lot better than some people have. That is no. that is very, <coughs> excuse me, very true. Um, that is one of my side effects. The weird thing about this thing is it's like I've gotten a different symptom every day. And today it is runny nose and uh, I have congestion in my chest, so coughing. So I apologize if I have to stop and cough like that. And I'm going to try not to... Uh, suck my runny nose back in into the microphone as I've done a few times with Megan prior to recording. Yep. We'll see how this episode sounds, guys. Yeah. And uh, anyway, with the social media whatnot taken care of, uh, I put on the itinerary. Let's let's go ahead and start with, excuse me, with Trivia with Tyler today. 
We're starting with trivia with Tyler. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and get it out of the way because you want to know what it deals with? What does it deal with? The Mandalorian. Oh, okay. <laughs> I figured I'd get that out of the way for all the people that loved our talking about Mandalorian every week. They thought it was gone, but it's not. <laughs> all right. So. All right. So, Tyler Nugget. Tyler Nugget. Uh, when the filming for the TV series The Mandalorian took place in 2019, the crew ran out of Stormtrooper costumes, so they called out to the local branch of a Star Wars fan organization whose members came to join the filming in their own homemade Stormtrooper costumes. So <laughs> they literally so got to cool. cosplay their way into <laughs> They got to cosplay the into the show. Yep. That is so cool. I'm oh jealous. Oh my gosh. And if you're on YouTube, you can see me answering my phone because I just read, uh, I keep my trivia with Tyler on there and I read friend Shelby sent me a text and said, when are you podcasting? <laughs> so I replied, right now. now. <laughs> um, all right. So that's trivia with Tyler. I still don't have my jingle for that yet. We're working on that. But yep, we'll get that. Now it's time to talk about the whiskey. Okay. Opening the bottle. So, as I said, mine was poured. I've got an ice ball in there. I don't know if you guys can necessarily see it with the glare on the screen there. Oh, sorry. I, I just did that into the mic. Um, there's uh, what I'm drinking today is uh, the same Basil Hayden's we had a few episodes ago, and I'm eager, I have been eager to try it with an ice ball. Uh, so I figured what better, what better chance? Um, I've smelt it. I've also dealt it. Um, <laughs> but at the moment, I can't really smell anything from this. Um, I... I get very, okay. very, very limited notes of anything. It just smells cold. Like, I, I just it feel the coldness. Cold. Yes, I feel the coldness on my nose. That's all I'm really getting. All um, right. I mean, that's something. But what I can oh. do is tell you what you're supposed to smell. And that okay. is spices, more spices with some herbal and tea fragrances. Uh, and I think the, the one note that I got a little bit earlier is was a tea, kind of a sweet tea smell, uh, but it was very faint because, you know, my nose is fucked up. Yeah, makes sense. So what are you drinking? I am drinking Conviction uh, bourbon, which we had um, during episode five, Dag Hammerschold. Um, this is the episode you got toasted on. Um, <laughs> and it was kind of a shit show. So I'm going to redo Conviction. It's almost um, like you could see my face <laughs> when you made that comment. Uh, this is with an ice ball. Um, so I'm assuming it's going to have a bit of a different um, experience than I had before. So. Um, I have I have gone ahead and tasted mine while you were talking. Um, okay. So what does you yours taste like as I smell mine? Um. Mm. That's right. You should tell what you you smell before I talk about my how mine tastes. Oh, that's true. Um, so smelling mine with the ice ball in it, I'm smelling chocolate. I want to say it's like a chocolate or like a fudge type smell. It's very sweet, very candy. -y. Okay. Um. What I'm supposed to be smelling is raw oak, vanilla fudge, chocolate covered cherries. Okay. So, I mean, I was kind of on the right track. I just mixed vanilla fudge and chocolate covered cherries into one thing. Wow. So, this is side note. Um, my mustache has gotten very long. Not that anybody can see that in the video. Uh, but it's hanging down over the top of my lips and I just happened to lick my lips and whiskey is living 
on the end of my mustache hairs right over my lips. Gross. <laughs> uh, can we please uh, get to what 2,500 uh, oh. unique listens so that we can deal with that? It's my mustache. The mustache is staying. We're, we need to make it prettier, though. We need oh, to trim it up. I, I can do that. I just don't like doing it. Um, <laughs> so I've tasted mine. Okay. What does yours taste like? In my, um, I don't want to say handicapped state, but in my, um, less infected, than optimal infected. Yeah. Less than optimal or infected state. I got a very bland taste on the tongue. Uh, almost. This is like I can see what I'm supposed to be tasting and I'm way off, but it almost tasted like unsweet tea. Uh, unsweet tea. Yeah, just unsweet. You know how it kind of has a I love a, unsweet tea. Bleh, because I'm not it. from the south. Unsweet tea is so good. False. I love my leaf water. Mm. I it, it's good depending on what you put in there. If you just want black tea unsweet. Yeah. No, so good. Um so, so good. Just regular black tea, unsweet. <laughs> so now I'm going to have to try Basil Hayden with an ice ball and see if it really does taste like unsweet tea. I get... Definitely can taste some corn on the back of my tongue. Um, very, very limited burn. No, you know, very, very... I mean, like, one out of ten burn. Uh, okay. As I as I swallow it, um, all around for me at this moment, just not very uh, flavorful. That's what I'm getting. Uh, I will admit, uh, if you're on, you're watching on YouTube. I have been drinking. Uh, I have a Mountain Dew Code Red. I've been using just to drink. Um, so that may have spoiled my palate a smidge. But what you're supposed to be tasting is white pepper, orange peel, lemon, and corn notes uh, with okay. a gentle note of cinnamon, rye spice, and sweet caramel. Uh, the finish is dry and brief, and it has a big bang of refreshing, nice cinnamon, pepperiness, and a light vanilla oakiness. So... In my infected so state, you I'm didn't get any of that. Pretty much, no. Okay. Well, that's fair, I suppose. I think, um, I'm just happy being... I got something. I haven't lost yeah. my taste. Yeah. Um. Well, I guess I will talk about mine then. Um. The ice ball has made the conviction whiskey 100% lose its burn. Um. It is something that you could chug if you wanted to wouldn't recommend it but you could um i don't get any burn doesn't matter how long i let it sit in my tongue doesn't matter the style in which i drink it um so that's a very neat experience um from the original uh episode five conviction where i do remember that it had a lingering burn um in my throat as far as taste goes it is very very sweet um with the ice ball in it, it's definitely a dessert whiskey. Um, I'm getting vanilla. I'm getting chocolate. A um, little bit of cinnamon. Um, but overall, it's I don't get anything other than like sweet candy type tastes. Um, I'm not getting any rye or any corn, any fruit. Candy, I guess. It's very, very interesting. I like it. Not bad. It's dangerous. Um, I'm sorry. What What did you say you were drinking again? Conviction. Conviction. Okay. Yes, this is the bourbon from Dag Hammerschold. Dag. Yeah, that's right. The one I got. Fuck Dang me. Hammerschold. Dang Hammerschold. Um, sorry guys, if you see me dicking around on my computer here, it's because I realized that I forgot there was one more thing I wanted to include on the wonder part today. And I just looked up the name and put it in there. So one of the things I distinctly recall from episode five when we had the Conviction Whiskey 
is that it had a super coffee taste. Like it tasted like a coffee whiskey. And drinking it now with the ice ball, I'm not getting any coffee anymore. It's just the sweetness. So um, no burn, no coffee, just candy. So. Interesting. Well, now I need to try that one with <laughs> an ice ball. Uh, if you're watching YouTube and you uh, happen to look at Megan's cam just now in the bottom, uh, for me, right corner, I think I think it's the same on YouTube. Uh, you just saw Bo make a guest appearance. Oh, He's been my quarantine buddy. He is I miss so Bo. tired. I haven't seen him in over a week. Yeah, he is so tired of <laughs> quarantining. Being inside. <laughs> I think I'm handling it better than he is. I mean, he's an Australian Shepherd, so... Yeah. Well, uh, we've been playing a lot. You sent me a really cute video of you and the pig toy. Oh, him, yeah. So. He loves that pig. Um, <laughs> all right. So, uh, any more comments on the on the whiskeys? Or um, do you think it's time? No, I think it's time to move on. We'll talk more at the end about what our final thoughts are. All right. Perfect. All right. So... so. Originally, um, this topic was, uh, I expected not to have nearly as much information on it as I did, but I, when I started, uh, researching on, I guess, Tuesday or Wednesday, the first day I was at home from COVID, uh, just the way my brain performed, I was very nervous about getting <laughs> the research done. Um, I, I'll put it this way. I, it took me pretty much all day Wednesday to write two paragraphs. Um, Yikes. Yep. But Friday and Saturday, I was a champ and ended up with basically five and a half pages worth of notes. Oh, <laughs> so God. Okay. I hope I did the so. topic justice, but. Anyway, right. um, what are what are we learning about? Tell me. We're going to learn uh, a brief history of the U.S. space shuttle program, but more importantly, we're going to focus on the um, ah fuck, what's the disasters of the Challenger and the Columbia? I couldn't uh, I couldn't think of the word. Snap. I wanted I wanted to say destruction, but I meant disaster. Oh snap! Um, okay. Um, this is very interesting. Oh yeah. I, I am very, I learned a lot doing this research and it was another, um, one of those that it was hard to start a lot of that was due to COVID because I love stuff like this. I love space stuff. And once I got into it and my brain was functioning, you know, halfway decent, I just started rolling. So um, All right. I am super interested. I've thought about doing the Challenger uh, ooh, explosion before, beat, so I'm you to it. very, very excited that you're doing it. All right. So we're going to start by talking about the history of the shuttle program. Uh, All right. The space shuttle program. Um, well, let's start off talking about what it was. Uh, yeah. Uh, the space shuttle uh, was a vehicle that was designed to transport people and equipment also known as payloads, into low orbit, uh, low orbit space, and glide back to the surface landing, similar to an airplane. So it was kind of a hybrid of a of a space. It was almost like a space airplane in a way. It went up yeah. via rocket, came down, landed like a plane. Um, the shuttle was made up of three parts: the actual shuttle itself that most people think of, where the crew and the payload went. Um, two solid rocket boosters called, uh, you know, labeled SRBs. Um, they were the white rockets when you see the typical uh, model of the space, da space shuttle, not space station. Um, <laughs> it's the two white rockets on the side. And then yeah. you had the um, expendable external tank called the ET, which was the big orange dildo looking thing that the space shuttle <laughs> big was Big orange dildo. To. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just go Google a picture of the space shuttle like at launch and you'll see the big orange dildo thing with two white things on the side and then the actual shuttle itself uh, connected uh. to the ET. 
Um, All right. I'm looking. To, oh, there is a big orange dildo. Okay. Yes, there is. <laughs> I never, okay. ever would have said that until you did that. And now well, I will never unsee it. So exactly. thank you. Um, so the two SRBs were there, as far as I understood it, to uh, give, provide the lift needed to get this big hunk of, hunk of burn Metal. love off of yeah. the ground and up in the air. Uh, the two yep. SRBs uh, were jettisoned from the rest of the craft before it reached orbit and the um, ET was jettisoned uh, just before orbit insertion, which is where the craft adjusts speed in order to enter orbit around Earth. Um, Essentially, the orange, the ET, uh, the big orange dildo, provided fuel to the shuttle's main engines. Um, I believe it was liquid oxygen and uh hydrogen yeah hydrogen um so very explodey yes um very very explodey just a heads or not a heads up i don't know why i said that a few major projects that the uh, shuttle program helped to launch or to uh work worked with i guess were the hubble space telescope galileo which is a craft that studied jupiter magellan 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 i don't know how you pronounce that it's like the explorer I think it's Magellan. Uh, that was sent to study Venus. Magellan. If it's the word I'm thinking of, it's Magellan. Yeah. M-A-G-E-L-L-A-N. Uh, that yeah. was sent to Venus to study. Um, and Ulysses? Ulysses? Like yeah, the president? Ulysses. Ulysses? Ulysses? I don't, Ulysses I, S. Grant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know how you pronounce that freaking name. Um that was sent to study the sun, and it also oh, helped... Houston's making fun of us next to me. He said it's Ulysses? What yeah. did you say? Ulysses. Oh, I said Ulysses. Ulysses. No, well, uh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, Houston no, just you, you're, started to laugh. So. You're fine. You tell Houston, tell, uh, what are we calling him? Butler? <laughs> Life you, partner? Butler? No, Butler. You tell Butler to keep it down. <laughs> All right, Butler, keep it down. That was um, from Tyler. <laughs> uh, the, the shuttle program helped with the uh, International Space Station and several other programs that were too many to list here. Um, originally, five shuttles were built. The first was named Enterprise after the Star Trek. Enterprise. After the Star Trek. Yep. Yep. Uh, but that one never actually, it was constructed without a heat shield and without engines. Oh, no. So it was never. Oh, so it was just a. Really big, expensive model. Uh, pretty much, yeah. It was a. It was a. Can we do this? Um, I think they used it possibly for some testing uh, inside the atmosphere, but it never went to space. Oh. Um, like I said, originally five were built. You, so you've got Enterprise, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, and Atlantis. Um, All right. We're going to talk about two of those. Columbia was the first built. Um. After the Challenger, after the destruction of the Challenger, spoiler alert there, sorry guys, if you don't know, it happened in 1986, so you should know. Um, uh, fifth shuttle was built and named Endeavor. Um, the first space shuttle uh, was launched on April 12th, 1981. All right, so that's a brief look at the shuttle program, what it did, and who the the, I don't want to say the ships are, but who the shuttles were, what they were called, and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah, their names. The... Okay. So we're going to talk about the Challenger now. All right. Uh, the Challenger, <laughs> I think a lot of people are going to know what that is. Um, yes, you, you, you probably should. It's been referenced in pop culture. Well, both of them have been referenced in pop culture a ton, but Challenger more so uh, just because of the time in history, I believe. In my opinion. And so tell tell us what happened. What is the Challenger? What so happened? Obviously the Challenger is one of the uh, space shuttles I just mentioned. Um, on <laughs> January 28th, 1986, approximately 73 seconds into its mission, Space Shuttle Challenger suffered a catastrophic failure that resulted in the craft breaking apart and falling back to the surface of the Earth. All seven members of the crew, including five NASA astronauts and two payload specialists, were killed in the disaster. Uh, the disaster 
went on to cause President Reagan to form the Rogers Commission to investigate the cause of the disaster. Um, I'm going to take this moment to apologize because I realized that seems like I just summed the entire thing up right there. I kind of did because I wrote that while I was high on COVID. So (laughs) uh, if I'm all over the place with this one, I apologize. I think it gets better because I was more organized doing the rest of this research. That first paragraph there just kind of was a summary. Did you, are you going to mention the teacher? Of course. I don't, honestly, I don't have a ton because uh, I'll just explain why later. Um, Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to make sure your COVID brain didn't forget. I, I spent all day Wednesday learning before I did any writing on Friday and, uh, Saturday. So NASA originally planned to launch the Challenger mission in December of 1985 but the launch was postponed several times due to weather and other factors until the morning of January 28th, 1986. This morning happened to be part of an extremely cold snap in Florida with temperatures getting down to 18 degrees Fahrenheit in Florida, in Florida, the morning of January 28th or or overnight. Um, at the time of the launch temperatures were 28 degrees Fahrenheit making this by far the coldest launch that had ever been attempted. I heard Megan this instead of making, but that could be just me being COVID ears listening for my name. (laughs) No, that's, that's my COVID speech. Um, uh, Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, Like I said, temperatures were 28 degrees at the time of the launch. Uh, In addition to the five NASA astronauts, uh, Challenger was transporting two payload specialists, which is a civilian who's trained for a certain quote-unquote payload on the shuttle. Uh, Gregory Jarvis was an engineer who was going to conduct experiments in space, and Krista, oh shit, if I was better, I would know how to say this. M- McAuliffe, I think is how you pronounce her name. I remember it in some of the videos I watched. Uh, she was a teacher. They were both part of the crew of the Challenger. Um, according to NASA transcripts and the crew cabin recorder, uh, the last words said were Roger go at throttle up by commander Dick Scobie approximately one second before the breakup followed by a, uh, Oh, by pilot Michael Smith, uh, just a half a second before the craft broke apart. Um, Uh I, I, I will be honest with you guys. This is, um, you know, if if you want to seek it out, it's out there. You can find these last moments. Oh, um, God, that sounds horrible. I, listen, I do not want to. I listened to both, and I could not make out an uh-oh, but NASA's official transcript has it in there. That's heartbreaking. Um, like, I, I can't even imagine being on that shuttle and knowing, like, in half a second I was going to be dead. I don't think, like they, I don't think they knew. You don't, don't think you don't, don't think uh oh meant oh no. I think uh oh meant something's wrong, and then it was before he could figure it out. It figure was, out what was wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll talk more about it because I don't want to spoil anything. We'll talk more about it. Okay. Um, All right. I will say this about the audio. Like I said, I found it for both uh, uh, Challenger and Columbia. It's not what you expect. It's um, it's just like that it just cuts off you don't hear an explosion yeah. or any anything like that it just cuts off uh there's actually a uh I, so this is what i was typing and what i was looking for just a minute ago uh i watched a netflix documentary called challenger the final flight um and it was a great documentary that actually covered a little bit of the columbia stuff too and if you want some emotions uh they have it in there they all, I would definitely recommend watching it. It's really well done. Um, they actually have footage of the flight commander in uh, Houston. What the hell, What is that called? Mission Control. Um, yep. Who was also a fellow astronaut. Usually they brought other astronauts in to do, to kind of run these things. They all just kind of worked together and helped each other out, it seemed like. Um, and you can see him right after he says, uh, Roger, go at throttle up, uh, right after 
Commander Dick Scobie says, Roger, go at throttle up. Um, his mouth just kind of falls agape. And like they just realize what's happening. Um, it's just something something to see. Uh, like I said, more emotions. There's, We'll talk about this later, but there are scenes from Columbia right before, from onboard Columbia, right before, oh. uh, as they started re-entry. Um, so we'll talk more about that later, but it is, it is a very well done documentary. Um, so if you want to cry, check out that documentary. Yeah. I'm not going to lie guys. Like it, it pulled at some emotions that I hadn't dusted off in years. Um, Tyler is not an emotional person. So no, I'm not. that is saying I was, something. I was bawling like a baby. Um, oh. watching these. Um, and I think it's very important. So I did it for both. I put all 14 names in this. I'm going to say every one of their names because these people are heroes. Okay. Um, when the craft broke apart, uh, the two SRBs both continued flying around the air and the, uh, ET exploded. Um, like I said, if you're into it and you want to see it and whatnot, you can check Google images and there are photos of debris, I guess is the best way to describe it, flying out from uh, the plume where the ET exploded. And people have, NASA released all this and there are labels where you can see, I believe it's part of a wing and blah, 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 but people have labeled where you can see the crew cabin flying mm. out of, of this plume. Um, and falling back towards the earth during it, during the, uh, breakup slash explosion, it's estimated that the cabin experienced between 20 and 12 G's. Um, but it was rapidly decreased to four G as it entered free fall. Just for reference, uh, top fuel dragsters hit around five and a half G. Um, the, I, I forgot to put this in here. Um, I know roller coasters stay like they can only hit a certain G to be legal. Yeah, I, I forgot to put something in here. I'm gonna blame it on COVID brain. Hold on, let me type it in at the at the end of this paragraph here. Just so I remember to mention it. Uh, um, looks like so, what the highest G force ever experienced on a roller coaster was six point three Gs. Yeah. So on the Tower of Terror in Tower of Terror in Gold Reef City in South Africa. So they experienced um extreme G forces. Yeah. It's twenty thought, G's would be Yeah. And enough to probably kill you. Yeah. Um it's thought we're we're gonna come to that right now, actually. It uh like I said, it's thought that at least part of the crew may have been alive and conscious, conscious, not conscience, conscious through the free fall. Uh, so oh the way God, the cabin, yeah, the way the cabin was arranged, um, the, the, there were two decks. One, I, if you're on YouTube, you can see my hands. If not, there was one on top of the other. Um, on the top deck is where uh, Commander Dick Scobie and Pilot Michael Smith were sitting uh, obviously seeing out the window, flying the craft and whatnot. Um, behind them on the top deck, and I found a little bit of inconsistency with this, but I'm going to go with the one I found more often. Mission specialist Ellison Oniz Onizuka, who was an Asian American, and Judy Resnick were sitting behind the commander and the pilot. Um, below them, on the mid deck was mission specialist Ronald McNair, a black man, and payload specialist Greg Jarvis and teacher Krista McAfee. Um, and I mentioned that Ronald was a black man and Ellison was Asian because if you notice, there's a black person, an Asian person, two women. NASA was very diverse in 1986. This was a time when, you know, the country itself was struggling through these things um, because this crew was announced in the late 70s. 
despite this taking place at um in 1986 sorry the covid brain um with the exception of uh teacher Krista McAfee yep. um so four personal egress air packs aka peeps were found on the flight deck during the during the recovery of debris three of which had been activated the activated packs belong to all members of the cabin except Commander Scobie. So what I officially found released by NASA was that pilot Michael Smith was wearing his peep and two other unnamed astronauts. So logic dictates if Commander Scobie did not have one on, the other two that were in uh, on the cabin, on the cabin, on the flight deck, sorry, uh, had put theirs on whether that was the the confusion I found was Ellison or Ronald where were they because one was set they were set to switch seats on the return mm. on the re-entry so oh. it, it was it was a struggle to figure out who who was where who was where on takeoff versus landing um but it seems like everybody except Commander Scobie uh, was wearing their, their peep, which suggests, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, these peeps were not designed to be used during flight, and the amount of air consumed was cons- consistent with the amount that would have been used uh, used up during the cabin's free fall back to Earth. Um, in addition, during recovery, it was found that several switches on the right-hand panel of Pilot Smith had been moved from their launch positions. Uh, these switches had lever locks that needed to be pulled before the switch could be moved. Um, afterward, NASA conducted tests and determined that neither the forces from the explosion nor the impact of the ocean would have been enough to move these switches. And that suggests that Smith moved these switches in order to try and restore power to the cabin after it separated from the rest of the shuttle. So what we can take away from these clues, is kind of what you hinted at earlier, um, some, if not all, members of the crew survived the explosion and the breakup and God. were in, they survived that 12 to 20 G, whether they were conscious or not. Um, NASA officials released a report on July 28th, <coughs> excuse me, July 28th, oh, oh. Uh, 1986, that stated it is unknown if the crew was conscious until ocean impact because it cannot be concluded whether the cabin remained pressurized or not during the free fall. If the cabin had depressurized, the crew would have quickly lost consciousness because the peeps only provided unpressurized air. um, But if it had remained pressurized, the crew would have been conscious until impact. Um, The cabin impacted the ocean approximately two minutes and 45 seconds after the initial breakup and the estimated acceleration was 200 Gs. 200? 200. Well beyond the limit of human survivability. It's also thought... Well, it's not thought. It's been calculated. This is what I forgot to add in there. Um, The cabin had reached terminal velocity by the time it impacted uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And what terminal velocity is, for anybody that doesn't know, is when an object is in free fall, terminal velocity is the maximum velocity it can obtain during that free fall. So they were traveling at the fastest they could go with the forces on Earth when they impacted the Atlantic Ocean. So I I hope for their sake, if any of them were alive when this happened. I hope they were unconscious. I hope they didn't feel anything. That is deceleration. Terrible. Yeah, that's terrifying and terrible for especially for somebody that doesn't like heights like me. Um, I don't know. I don't think they would have felt anything when they impacted the ocean. It would have been so quick. They were going over. I believe, if memory serves, it was two hundred seven miles an hour when they impacted the ocean. So it would probably. 
what's scarier to me is being conscious for the flight down, knowing, not knowing when, but knowing. I would, ho- I hope they were unconscious. I hope I do too. It was peaceful. Me God, too. that's, um, like Oof. I said, these, these people were heroes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the aftermath now. <clears throat> President Ronald Reagan assigned former Secretary of State and also former Attorney General William P. Rogers to investigate the disaster, and the Rogers Commission was formed. A couple, there were like 14, 15 members of this commission, but just a few of them, uh, the famous people that you would know, are Neil Armstrong, Richard Feynman, who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, and Sally Ride, the first female astronaut to go into space. Um... According to the Rogers Commission, this is where things get dicey as far as what caused everything. Uh, so according to the Rogers Commission, Morton Thicol, which was a contract or the contracting company that produced the solid rocket boosters, had observed damage to O-rings, which is a rubber gasket. If you don't know what an O-ring is, it's a rubber gasket that's used to seal uh, and in this sense, it was used to seal hot gases, excuse me, inside the SRBs. Um, they had observed damage in the O-rings during previous launches. Um, they noted that below 39 degrees Fahrenheit, the O-rings became less flexible and that it was, it didn't, no. it didn't go back to the shape it was meant to be in. Uh, below 39 degrees is basically what they determined. And um, the engineers at Thicol were uh, just waiting for, uh, I don't want to say just waiting, that sounds terrible. It, they realized it was a matter of time before they, the O-rings failed and resulted in a catastrophic failure. Um, at the time, no previous shuttle had shuttle launch had occurred below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, during its investigation, the Rogers Commission discovered that NASA had been aware of this design flaw since 1977. Oh, That's no. A, uh, so this... Nine years, if anybody's doing the math. This should have been avoided. Absolutely. Um, oh, my... Yeah, we're, we're going to mm. we're gonna get, get into this for a little bit. Um, mm. The Rogers Commission discovered they had been aware of it since 1977 and also criticized NASA's decision-making process that allowed challenger to launch um, because the night prior to the launch due to the cold snap that weather forecasts had predicted NASA decided to hold a conference call with Morton Thicol Um, in this call Thicol engineers recommended that the launch be postponed again due to concerns about how well the O-rings could handle the cold they asked that they launch in the afternoon when it had warmed up um And they just were ignored. Like they didn't know. Uh, I've got detail on it. I'm just, I, I keep okay. losing my place, honestly. Um, Sorry. No, I just, no, you're fine. Oh, um, that's heartbreaking. COVID brain, man. Uh, like I said, like all engineers recommended that the launch be po- postponed uh, due to concerns about the O rings and the cold. Uh, NASA could not launch against a recommendation not to launch by a contractor. So essentially, if like all management, listened to their engineers and said, we do not recommend launching. NASA's hands were tied. They couldn't launch. Okay. Um, so why, on, on why, this conference did... call, NASA officials were quoted as saying, I am appalled by your recommendation. That's George Hardy. And my God, thy call. When do you want me to launch? Next April? That was said by Larry Malloy. Oh my God. Larry, they weren't on the shuttle. They were not. These were uh, Larry Malloy was the manager of the space shuttle SRB program and George Hardy was the deputy director of science and engineering, both of them at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, Thicol executives essentially asked for, hey, can we, can we put you on hold and call you back in a minute um, after these statements were said? Um, and so Thicol... Uh, originally was on board with its engineers. They were not going to recommend the launch. Uh, Thicol executives, I'm sorry. Um, But during this break, 
the general manager turned to his three senior managers and basically said, we're going to take a vote on it. It's time to take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. No, no, you never take off your engineering hat. Well, that is the hat you wear. They took off the managers, put on the manager hat and they took a vote on whether or not to launch. All four voted to launch. Um, Matter of fact, as if our memory serves, three of the four voted the way that I, uh, I, I, I misrepresented that. They took a vote. The general manager, it was three to one uh, to launch. And the general manager told the one that voted not to launch, it's time to take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. And he changed his vote to launch after that. So God, I, the statements, I'm so mad. Yeah, yeah. The statements from NASA... <laughs> Uh, who was Thaikal's largest customer, ultimately pressured the executives into approving the launch. Um, NASA had an ambitious schedule for launches, and NASA officials were worried that if they fell behind on the schedule, they would lose money from their budget, and no con- no contracted company wanted to be the reason uh, behind delaying a shuttle. Uh, one other tidbit, and I don't have this in my notes, but it's in the documentary, and I don't exactly remember the reason why. Um, but be, uh, I think it was because it was getting so, it was supposed to be so cold that night in an attempt to prevent, uh, freezing of emergency water lines. They were left Mm -hmm. on around the space shuttle overnight. And so when people arrived in the next morning for fueling and whatnot, there were giant icicles hanging off of the space shuttle, which was another reason they shouldn't have launched. Uh, oh, but they no. went around and knocked all those off, essentially. Um, but I, <laughs> This is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, after the disaster, uh, the space shuttle program was grounded for three years. Oh, excuse me. Uh, it was grounded for three years while the uh, SRBs were redesigned and new policies were put in place on decision-making uh, for future launches. NASA was criticized for not disclosing uh, the true dangers of the space shuttle to the general public despite allowing a member of the general public to travel in the shuttle. And that member was Krista McAuley. So the teacher, the teacher, whose students watched her, whose students live. watched her live as did the majority of the country. They watched this space shuttle blow up in the morning. And i tell you the thing that I, I told you, I bawled my eyes out at one point during this documentary. Um, The thing that got me on that was they had all the families were there watching as it happened, obviously. Um, And it was Commander Scobie's son. Like, nobody knew what was happening. They just saw two, a big puff of white cloud and then two new uh, vapor trails from where the two rockets had split off. They didn't know what was going on, um, but his son, Commander Scobie's son, said, if they're in trouble, my dad will do everything, everything he can to get them out. And I think that says a lot, um, especially considering Commander Scobie was the only one of the four on the flight deck found without a, what was it called? A, a peep. Peep, yeah. I don't know whether that means he was up and about putting them on people, or if he even was able to. Maybe he was unconscious. I don't know, but for whatever reason, um, yeah, just that stirred emotions that I haven't dusted off in a while. Yeah. Ah, man. Um, so, uh, one other note, this is not in my notes, but I do remember seeing it somewhere. The, there's a building at the Kennedy Space Center that houses the, um, I don't want to say remains, but the debris recovered from, you know, this accident. And I, I think it said something like the press had been let in once. And until then, it had only been scientists that had been let in to see this stuff. Like the press had been let in once and they've never been let back in. Or maybe mm-hmm. it wasn't even the press. Maybe it was just uh, the families were let in. But uh, it's, it's under lock and key on the sixth floor of some building at the Kennedy Space Center. Maybe it was the seventh floor, but 
interesting, interesting little yeah. tidbit. I'm glad they're studying it. Yeah. Um. So, <clears throat> with all that being said, let's move on to the Columbia, which I actually remember this happening. I remember where I was and what I was doing. All right. Well, um, I don't, do you do you remember it happening? Um. No, but most of my childhood is just a black spot. And I don't remember anything. Gotcha. Uh, but well, I was at my dad's. Happened? I was at my dad's. It was, uh, that means it had to be either Saturday or Sunday morning. Um, and I remember just sitting there watching, I, I think it was some cable news channel, seeing maybe it was ABC or something, but we watched it. We watched it on TV. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Columbia was actually the very first space shuttle that was launched. Uh, on April 12th, 1981. And it made a total of 28 launches in its lifetime. The final launch it only coming... only takes one. To yep, the final launch uh, was made January 16th, 2003. And upon completion of this mission, the shuttle was scheduled to be retired. Mm. Um, as I said, you know, I felt it was important to put the names of everybody... Uh, so on January 16th, 2003, Columbia launched from Kennedy Space Center carrying Commander Rick Husband, Pilot William McCool, Payload Commander Michael Anderson, Payload Specialist Ilan Ramon. I think that's how it's I L A N R A M O N. He is the first Israeli astronaut. Uh, mission Specialist Kalpana Chawla. David Brown, and Laurel Clark. Uh, so again, a very diverse crew. An Israeli uh, man, two women, uh, a African-American woman, and I think all the other guys are just white dudes. They're just plain <laughs> boring. But um, So approximately 81.7 seconds into the launch, a piece of foam broke off from the outside of the external tank and collided with the left wing of the shuttle. Mm. This was not felt by the crew, um, but a six to 10 inch hole was created on the left wing, reinforced carbon, carbon leading edge panel, uh, reinforced carbon, carbon uh, will be abbreviated as an RCC. Um, NASA had observed a bipod. I'm sorry. NASA had observed bipod ramp insulation falling off in four previous launches one being just two launches prior um, that launch two launches prior was STS-112 um, and on that lot, launch NASA had installed a camera and named it the ET cam to observe this exact issue foam shedding as they called it during STS-112 uh, NASA observed a large piece of foam impacting the left SRB, leaving a three-inch deep dent in the SRB's outer shell. Yikes. NASA, yep, NASA decided to proceed with launches because there was, quote, no new concerns and no added risk. Um, a foam strike. Excuse me? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, ooh, I just got to... Now that I'm getting down to the end of my whiskey, I just got a good good taste of it there. Um, <laughs> while Columbia went on to enter orbit successfully, NASA engineers were worried and requested NASA executives to allow the astronauts to inspect the left wing while in orbit. The engineers also requested DOD imaging of the shuttle so that they could potentially view the wing and determine if any damage had been done. Both of these requests were denied. NASA executives appeared to have the mindset that nothing could be done to repair the shuttle while it was in space and instead decided to focus on conducting a what-if scenario to determine risk probabilities for future flights. John Harpold, Director of Mission Operations, told another NASA official, Wayne Hale, quote, You know, there's nothing we can do about damage to the thermal protection system. If it has been damaged, it's probably better not to know. 
I think the crew would rather not know. Don't you think it would be better for them to have a happy, successful flight and to die unexpectedly, unexpectedly oh, during re-entry than to stay on orbit knowing there was nothing to be done until the air ran out? Hale uh-huh. also admits that this was the mindset of many people at NASA at the time, even the astronauts themselves. So it sounds like a little bit of workplace uh, I don't want to say what is that word when you get com- complacency? Complacency. Yeah, that's, that's complacency. One. That's goddamn COVID that's, <laughs> I am flabbergasted. Yeah. Um, NASA do better. Oh yeah. my god. Uh, well, this is about to make it even worse. NASA <sighs> believed the RCC panels to be very durable. Charles Bolden, who went on to serve as administrator of NASA under Obama and was an astronaut around this time, was quoted as saying, excuse me, excuse me, uh, I spent 14 years in the space program flying, thinking that I had this huge mass that was about five or six inches thick on the leading edge of the wing. And to find out after Columbia that it was fractions of an inch thick and that it wasn't as strong as the fiberglass on your Corvette, that was an eye opener, and I think for all of us, wasn't as strong as the fiberglass on your Corvette. Yep, this thing's going into space, y'all. And your Corvette is safer, <laughs> basically. Oh my gosh! Uh, well, that's, maybe not safer, but you know, but it, stronger, it built stronger. Yeah, that's uh, wow. Sorry, I had to sniff my nose over there. Um. I didn't hear it through Good. Discord, Good. which then, is the program we're using to communicate. Yes, it um, is. Um, so. so NASA engineers ah. also used damage prediction software created from previous flight data to determine possible RCC damage from the impact. This software was designed to predict small ice particle impacts since that was the main object likely to impact the RCC during launch. Um, because of this, NASA engineers believed that the model tended to overstate damage from small projectiles and assumed it uh. would also overstate damage from larger spray-on foam insulation. You uh, know what they say about assuming. Yes, I do. And it makes it an did. ass out of you and me. It certainly did. Um, I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, my nose. So one thing that's amazing with this, and I'm sure you guys have a experienced it anytime you've got a cold or the flu or something my right nostril constantly feels like i'm about to sneeze and so it makes my eyes <laughs> water and yeah so i'm dealing with that too and i'm not just you're saying, supposed to get your uh septum surgery soon yeah right? well i had, to, I, had well. I had that and a dentist appointment scheduled for next week but that ain't happening now yeah that's not happening now well yep so darn. they've been post postponed um uh, like I said, NASA engineers uh, assumed it would overstate the damage that the spray-on foam insulation would cause, and they were they rationalized that the density of the foam would only slightly damage the panel's coating and not completely penetrate it due to the density of the material. Um, despite all this, on January 23rd, 2003, flight director Steve Stitch sent an email to Commander Husband and Pilot McCool, informing them of the strike, but also telling them, quote, there is absolutely no concern for safety. No um, concern for safety. We're fine. Yep. Don't don't worry about it. He's fine. We got you. That could happen. Wait, what just happened? You, you got all funny sounded. I said, what's the worst that could happen? Okay. Um, I, don't, I, don't, it, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Your, your mic's... Sounded real funny in my ear. I don't know how it is for oh, others. Well, is it like underwater? Yes. Uh, the anyway, cat's laying on my mic cord. So let's that might be what's. I don't know. That might be what's doing it, but it comes and goes. Okay. Let's see. Is it better now? It it is now. I'll let you know if I hear it okay. again. All right. I like pulled the mic cord out from under her, and she's looking at me like I just. Bitch! What the fuck? You the just. Oh no! It's still doing it. Oh no! I oh. hope you guys can hear that. Yeah, I hope so too. Well. It is what it is. We're committed at this point. Yeah, that's true. Um, I'm sorry. The joys of doing this virtually, guys. 
Um, so at 8.59, oh shit, I don't know how to read time like this. Fuck. Uh, 8.59 p.m.? At, at eight, no, at 8.59.32 a.m. So half of a second past 8.59 is what that's trying to say, basically. At 8.59 and a half a.m. on February 1st, 2003, as it re-entered the atmosphere over Texas, Mission Control lost communication with Shuttle Columbia. It was during mid-communication with Commander Husband. Videos show that Columbia, video from the ground, show that Columbia had disintegrated into pieces by 9, nine o'clock and 18 milliseconds. Like, I don't know how to read that. It's 90018. Um, AM. And, reading it right. Yeah, and by nine zero zero fifty seven AM, the cabin was seen breaking into pieces, and it is thought if the crew was not already dead, this is the moment that killed them. NASA okay. released a report in two thousand eight uh, on the survivability of the crash, and established that the crew was exposed to five lethal events in the following order. The first was depression. Five. five events five lethal events during this uh accident i'll call it yeah okay uh, the first it was it was in this following order the first event was depressurization the cabin remained pressurized for a few seconds that allowed the crew to attempt to regain control but begin rapidly spinning and the underside was very weak because it's not supposed to be exposed to um for you know aerodynamic forces like this yep. um and when it became exposed to those forces it broke into pieces um off nominal dynamic g environment uh basically because the cabin was rotating so fast and so violently and the protective equipment that the astronauts were wearing was not designed to withstand the forces being put on their bodies um so i'll give you an Example, a couple examples of what that means. You've ever seen a, an astronaut's helmet? They can move their head oh, okay. in the inside. Can you hear me? Yep, I can now. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> Doing this digitally. Yep. Um. So, have you ever seen how an astronaut's helmet? What was the last thing you heard? I guess. Um, you were talking about the second. Okay. Um, Off nominal dynamic G environment. Basically, uh, the cabin was rotating so fast, so violently that the uh, protective equipment wasn't designed to withstand the forces being put on their bodies. So I'll give you two examples. Um, you, you've ever seen how an astronaut's helmet is. They can like move their head inside the helmet and turn and look and yeah. see things. Yeah. Um, when your body is exposed to... Oh, sorry. My nose is... Ooh, my nose. <laughs> When your body's exposed, yeah, no, I'm taking everything I have not to sneeze right now. Um, so their heads uh, moved freely inside, and when exposed to rapid G forces, it just kind of banged around. You can't see me on camera, but if you're on YouTube, it just kind of flops around inside this helmet, um, which has uh oh, looks like Megan has lost me. I'm back. All oh, right, Megan's back. <laughs> um, so their heads flopping around inside this, uh, bowl basically yeah like fish okay. bowl. and so i can picture that um in addition uh the harnesses they used exposed had most of their upper torso uh free to move so that they could hit buttons and you know do stuff like fly the ship and whatnot um basically the restraints had a similar effect on arms and legs um they were uh they were quote unquote free to move around and they found fracturing consistent with flailing arms and legs and fracturing um in the necks of crew members. Mm -hmm. Uh so that was the second thing that was lethal. The third thing, so basically if they didn't die from depressurization, they had a fucking miserable experience. lots of miserable. things could have God. But they okay. Were, the third thing, have, just to put you at ease, they excuse me, they definitely uh, would have been unconscious from depressurization. The uh, third 
The third uh, lethal thing they faced was separation from the module in seats. Like they went, they got un- untouched. Seatbelts came undone. Um, I don't take that that way, but you could. I take that as more of, like I said, flailing arms and legs. Okay. Okay, I can see that too. Uh, so, and I will, I don't think I put this in here, but I will mention that um, people went against uh, national orders and did go scavenging for debris, even though they were told not to. And people, witnesses on the ground reported seeing things like a human skull, part of oh, a torso, God. a human heart, femur bones. So they probably just didn't, the belt didn't break. They probably were just ripped apart. Oh my God. Um, Exposure to high speed and high altitude environment. Um, the altitude at which the shuttle disintegrated contained very little oxygen, very little pressure. They would have experienced extreme heat due to deceleration. You know, whenever something enters our atmosphere, it basically catches on fire. Um, all while being in extremely freezing cold temperatures. Not exactly what the human body's built for. Yeah. And finally, the final lethal incident that uh, the crew would have impacted is uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Impact with the ground. Smack. Yeah. Um, Not to be insensitive, but I mean, hopefully for their own sake, they were at least unconscious after unconscious. I keep saying unconscious, unconscious (laughs) after depressurization. Um, uh. the report went on to say the Columbia depressurization event occurred so rapidly that the crew members were incapacitated within seconds before they could configure the suit for full protection from loss of cabin pressure. So basically depressurization occurred so fast they didn't have a chance to react. Yeah. Uh, Although circulatory systems functioned for a brief time, the effects of depressurization were severe enough that the crew could not have gained, could not have regained consciousness. So this event was lethal to the crew. Goodness gracious. Um, Ooh, that one tasted like bubble gum. Bubble gum? Yeah, that's the flavor I'm getting. Bubble gum and vanilla. Oh, that's what I'm getting. (laughs) Your taster's messed up. Yep. COVID, baby. That was supposed to simulate uh, doing coke since I saw <laughs> high on COVID. Um, so after the shuttle disintegrated, uh, weather radars detected the debris trail over eastern Texas and Louisiana. I found that to be a neat, not a neat, but an interesting factoid. Interesting factoid, yeah. Um, another one I found interesting was that a, like I said earlier, people ignored orders to go, don't go scavenge for these parts. Don't go looking for this stuff. Um, so a three day amnesty period was offered to any civilian who had collected debris from the wreckage. Um, during these three days, people came forward with debris from Columbia, uh, and this is what I found weird is people came forward with other NASA property as well as debris from the Challenger disaster. From the Challenger? Yeah. People had had, they came forward with stuff they had had since 1986. I guess Paul Paul picked it up. Oh no. I don't know. Yeah, I found that to be very weird. Why why were you saving bits from the Challenger? But I mean, I guess, you know, it was a national tragedy. (laughs) Yeah. And I, think about it. It was 1986. Everybody, there was no internet. There wasn't a, as much of a 24 seven news cycle. So everybody was watching and the space shuttle was a big thing back then still. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. you know, a, a good chunk of the country was watching it happen oh, versus, man. I mean, like I said, I know where I was and what I was doing, but you know, how many people are out there like you have no idea what they were doing when Columbia happened. Yeah. Wow. Hold, please. Oh, man. If you're, if you're on uh, YouTube, you just saw like the... Oof. I feel like I have to sneeze so badly right now. It's <laughs> not even funny. 
my eyes watering too. And I promise I'm not saying that because I was emotional during this. I am. <laughs> I, w- I was genuinely worried. A I was going to get story. No, I was genuinely worried. I was going to get choked up doing this, but I've held it together except for this stupid sneezy thing. I'm proud of you for holding um, it together. Um. So, and this, I mentioned this briefly and it's on the documentary on Netflix and you can find it on YouTube. If you want a, uh, eerie eerie scene a videotape was recovered that was made by the astronauts during re-entry as you can tell columbia broke up on re-entry it's a 13 minute video that shows the flight crew joking around with one another while conducting the typical re-entry procedures appearing as nothing's wrong um, it shows one of the coolest shots I think I've ever seen. Um, and that's the flames and the plasma that's visible when re-entering the atmosphere from the inside of the space shuttle. It looks awesome. Um, the video was supposed to record the entire descent until landing, mm-hmm. but it ends about four minutes before the first telemetry signs um, that suggested there were issues with the shuttle. So, it's thought that perhaps the crew realized something wasn't quite right. Um, Perhaps this video ending four minutes was the first failure or one of the first failures of the shuttle. I'm not sure how this video was necessarily recorded. I couldn't find any of that information, but it stopped about four minutes before the first telemetry signs appeared that there were issues with the shuttle. So, oh, damn sneeze. It needs to come or go. Um, So let's talk about the aftermath. As with Challenger, or as with the Challenger, uh, the shuttle fleet was grounded for two years and a commission was set up to investigate the accident and concluded that the quote-unquote immediate cause of the accident was a, quote, breach in the leading edge of the left wing caused by insulating foam shed during launch. The report also criticized NASA policies, condemning the organization for having a, quote, compromise of safety mentality. Um... The report also suggests that a potential rescue mission, while very risky, may have been possible if NASA had acted fast enough, typically due to the amount of consumables on board being limited. So you think air, food, water, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, the, the amount of time people can spend on the shuttle is, you know, limited to what the mission is, is, is scheduled for. Um, however, um, Columbia had an abnormally large number of consumables due to an extended duration orbiter package on board. Uh, so this gave the crew enough consumables to live until February 15th. In addition, Atlantis, shuttle Atlantis was scheduled for launch on March 1st. 2003 but the report suggests that it could have safely been expedited for launch on February 10th 2003 so if you're with me here they could launch another shuttle anytime February 10th or after and the crew had enough consumables to stay until February 15th so there is the potential that there was a five day overlap period. Now, you know, who knows what the weather would have been like during that five days. Um, you know, this is the what if game that nobody likes to play. Yeah. Yeah. But there is the potential that NASA could have sent Atlantis as a rescue shuttle and just left the Columbia up there with all our other space junk that's sitting on our porch. (laughs) Sitting on our, we talked about oh, that on man. here, right? How we're the redneck house of the universe of the of the um, solar system. 
I do not recall that conversation. Oh, okay. Well, let's talk about it real quick. You think about what we've done with space. We've put <laughs> all our trash in our atmosphere or right outside of our atmosphere. All these satellites and all these old <laughs> broken space toys we don't want anymore. And, you know, if an alien comes and visits us, that's like our front porch. Everybody's, Aliens are not going to ever stop here. Ex- everybody's got that redneck house that's on their, <laughs> somewhere in their neighborhood that has too much junk piled outside. Occasionally, we don't have a driver's license. We can't go far into space. Every once in a while, we get <laughs> drunk and get on our lawnmower and go to the, go to the convenience <laughs> store. That's us going to the moon. Um, you know, but we have oh, the, the redneck house. Of the solar system. We are the redneck house of the solar yes, system. We got space junk and we can't drive anywhere. So we just get drunk and go to the moon sometimes. And we always fight with each other. Like, but yeah, I didn't even think about that. But yeah, no, you're right. Yep, we're always fighting each other. So, um, yeah, we're never going to make space contact, guys. Supposedly they have to release that here, here soon. It was in the COVID stimulus bill. Uh, that's yeah, I'll believe that oh. when I see it. Yeah. Joe Rogan's uh, all in a tizzy about it. Oh, um, so the report included several recommendations such as improving pre-flight inspection routines, increasing the quality of images available during the launch, uh, during the launch and flight, uh, securing the goddamn foam. Uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit on that one. Um, yeah. establishing an independent authority responsible for identifying, analyzing, and controlling shuttle hazards. And all shuttle components needed to be recertified prior to 2010, or by the end of 2010. Um, in December 2005, the cause of the foam shedding was determined to be thermal expansion and contraction while the ET was being uh, filled. Uh, which caused cracks in the foam uh, resulting in foam loss. Not human error, as was previously believed. Which I guess technically, not knowing that is human error, but, you know, tomato, tomato. Uh, And that's, that's a, that's a gray area. I don't. Yeah. But. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about that. Um, one, one other little factoid on the aftermath of the Columbia accident. Um, All, uh, with the exception of one mission to service the Hubble telescope, all space shuttle missions launched after the destruction of Columbia uh, were to the International Space Station only, so that the crews would be able to stay on board the space station in case another situation arose where the shuttle was not safe for re-entry into the atmosphere and another shuttle could come pick them up. Yep. Um, The space shuttle program was active until 2011, making a total of 133 successful flights with two tragic failures. On July 21st, 2011, 5.57 a.m., Space Shuttle Atlantis touched down and with this touchdown officially ended the space shuttle program and American astronauts had two bum rides from the Soviets (laughs) until Elon Musk, Papa Elon. Now we got Tesla rockets. I, I know it's a joke conspiracy theory that Elon Musk is an alien from Mars and he's trying to get back home, but you know what? He's, there's, he is an interesting man. I'm just going to leave it at that. Yes, he is. I think, I think when he was on uh, Joe Rogan and smoked weed, that was the, uh, he's like writing back to Mars, like, dude, they got this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I never even watched that episode of Joe Rogan. But anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. The uh, document, doc, document, the documentary on Netflix is called Challenger, the final flight. Well worth a watch. It's, in episodes, it's very good, very, uh, very well done. You want to dust off the old sad emotions. And like I said, like Megan said, I'm not an emotional person. I'm, I'm more of a robot than I am a person. Um, so, yeah, if you want to dust off the old sad emotions, get uh, get your ass in there and watch out on Netflix. Yeah. Because the interviews right. with the family and whatnot are... 
Oh, I had heart wrenching. Yeah. And Megan being the ball of emotion she is. Megan will be in tears from the first moment. Yep. Uh, yep. The entire what two hour documentary, I will just be crying. Oh, the no, I think it's like I think there's like four or five episodes that are like forty five minutes long each. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so it's, it's, I'm gonna it's, need a, like a giant gallon of water next to me so I don't get dehydrated. Oh yeah, I, I would recommend in sections. Episode <laughs> by episode. <laughs> um so that is what I have. All right. Excuse me um, for the wonder section. So I reckon let's get on into uh, this. Final thoughts. All right. I just uh, checked my phone. Sorry to get sideways. 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 <laughs> um. Track. Uh, yeah. Whatever. Sideways. Sidetrack. COVID brain. I'm high on COVID. Um, I just, I got a very sweet text while all that was going on, uh, from friend June, um, Aww. just apparently just found out I had COVID and she sent me a very, very sweet text. I didn't read the whole thing, but I just glanced at it. Uh, thank Aww. you friend June for your concern. I am doing okay. I don't, I think she listens. Um, <laughs> if not, I'll, I'll text her back here shortly. <laughs> I, her husband listens. Yeah. I mean, I they know. might, yeah. they might both listen. Yeah. But, um. If y'all do listen, thanks. We appreciate y'all's support. 100%. All right. So I finished my drink, surprisingly, through all that talking. Uh, oh, that you almost never finish your drink while you're the I, well, I kept wonderer. Having to, yeah, I kept having to take breaks to not sneeze and cough, and I would always sneak a drink. Oh, um, well. Very sneaky. Yes. Uh, like I said, you guys got little tidbits of what I was tasting. Uh, cause I'm not going to remember them while I'm wondering. So I'm going to let Megan talk about her drink now. All right. Um, conviction with an ice ball is awesome. I really like it. Um, it's, I, I'm not going to read it as high as I think I rated the original conviction. Um, if we even rated that episode, I can't even remember <laughs> if we did or if you were so drunk that we just like ended it. Uh, um, I think we rated every episode, but I don't know. I don't remember being I drunk for that one. So, what it, do I know it, it's been a long time. Everything blurs together. Um, so I like the conviction with an ice ball, but it is very sweet. Um. It's super chocolatey, super vanilla-y. Um, there's not a whole lot of whiskey flavor to it, I guess, um, for lack of a better explanation. Um, so, because I, even though I like it, it's something that I will drink again with an ice ball. I would probably rather have Conviction, though, without the ice ball. And that might be because it's it has a strong coffee taste, and I love coffee. Um, so I'm I'm gonna give conviction with an ice ball a. We'll do right in the middle lane. We'll do a five out of ten. Five out of ten conviction with an ice ball. Um, I don't think it's fair for me to even rate Basil Hayden's. It was good, but I can't really. I couldn't really taste, taste too much of it, so maybe I am losing my taste buds and my smell. My That's sense of smell. Definitely possible. Fucking don't do drugs, kids. Don't do COVID. It's bad. In all seriousness, please stay safe. Yeah, y'all. Don't. Uh, this has been a very weird illness. It's been very... Uh, the first couple of days, I was tired. Like I would get up and walk 10 feet to the bathroom and then come back and just be exhausted. Not like breathing heavy, just mentally and not, not even mentally, just physically exhausted. Physically exhausted. Yeah. Just. Like, uh, it, it was, it's just weird not doing anything. My body was tired from just fighting this disease, this virus. Um, but I'm a survivor. I'm going to push through this. Uh. All right. So, I guess we're done with the final thoughts then on that note. Yep. yep. Um, so we got a couple of uh, 
stuff thingies. Stuff thingies. Yep, here that we go. That is our technical term. Stuff thingies. The stuff thingies. Mail time. Mails. All right. That's what we, we did got. get a few mails. The stuff thingies are our mails, guys. All right. Um, we got a couple of different mails this week. So thank you guys for reaching out. Um, please continue to reach out to us. That is whiskey and wonder at gmail.com. So I'm, I'm going to butt in for one minute. There's not been very many um, sound effects and whatnot in this episode because one, I've been talking a ton. And two, um, I can't really see Megan to judge when she wants me to hit something. Um, yeah. But we did go through the uh, process of getting all this set up so that she can hear uh, sound effects. Um, yes, that because, was an <laughs> interesting setup. Yeah, it was a hell of a thing to try and get everything so that she could hear because at first she could hear everything except the sound effects. Yep. Um, so it was uh, interesting to try to do that. But since we put all that hard work in, I have to play this. <gasps> <laughs> Oh, it sounds uh, like we lost Megan halfway through her laugh. Oh, she's back. Oh, my sound. Yep, my sound. I'll never live that sound down. I, I put a lot of work into uh, into getting it set up so that she could hear the the <laughs> noises, so I, I need some kind of payoff here. Oh, thank you, Tyler, for all your hard work, especially as you've been sick. We appreciate uh, you. I I got to do what I got to do to keep this going. Yes. Wouldn't have it any other way. Anyway, talk to us about the mails we got. All right. So our first mail um, comes from a listener that didn't say he wished to not be anonymous. So we're going to assume that um, they wish to be anonymous. So he says, hi, Tyler and Megan and happy 2021. Friend Shelby turned me on to your podcast, and I have been enjoying episodes one through four and would love to make a donation, and if I may, make a few requests for you to critique. You guys rock. And he went on to send a donation our way, so thank you so much, um, anonymous donator. Yes, thank you very much. Um, do you have... Every... Yeah. Do you have the uh, whiskeys that he requested we try because I personally am looking very forward to one. Yes. Uh, so he wants us to try Campfire which is one we have talked about wanting to try since episode three. Yes. I am um, very much looking forward to this. Yes. 100% once you're healthy and everything. Um, he also wants us to give a try of Maker's Mark 46. And that's something I've never heard of. Uh, like I have not I, heard of it either. I've heard of Maker's Mark. Yes, but I've had Maker's Mark. It's all right. It's good. That was at a time I'm, when I didn't know what was happening as far as whiskeys go, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> it was a time when I consumed alcohol for the effect, not the taste. Remember those days? Oh, uh, yeah. They were six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's not quite true. Maybe more like a year ago. Yeah, I don't know when we started this. We've been attempting to start a podcast for over a year. Yeah, we've. This is um, episode seventeen. So yeah, so it's seventeen quarter, weeks, quarter of a year, just over a quarter of a year. Wow. All right. I hope you guys are enjoying us. We're planning to stick around for a while, so keep keep on hanging on. Keep us yep. in your thoughts and Absolutely. send us your emails and everything. Friend, uh, anonymous. I have you written down here on the mailbag as, um, with your name, uh, friend anonymous. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We are going to get those. They will be on a future episode, but it is probably going to be a little ways down the road just because I, I do know some people who have had COVID who did lose their taste and their smell and it took them a month or so to get them back. So just in case yep. uh, it doesn't come up soon, that will be why we want to give a solid effort to 
you know, to sampling these whiskeys, and it's kind of hard. If my dumb ass can't taste or smell. And hopefully Megan just won't have it. Yep, I'm, that's, no symptoms, that's the, the goal. Yep, and um, I, I think we should probably do this virtually next week, and possibly yes. even the week after. Yep. So, if you guys hated this, sorry. We're gonna I'm sorry, you're going to get a couple more weeks yep. just to be safe. Just so you know, um, I didn't I didn't turn your camera off. It's staring over the mic. It just, it just oh, at my piano there. just at nothing? Yep. It's you guys can just spot. imagine me there then. Yep. Just yep. picture me in your mind's eye. Yep. Shadily glancing at the camera. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I've been doing it today too. Uh, all right. Our second email um, comes from a friend of the podcast that does not uh, need to remain anonymous. So this is friend Morgan. Woohoo! So, thank you, friend Morgan. Thank you, friend Morgan. So Morgan says, Hi, Megan and Tyler. Just wanted to say how amazing your podcast is. Most of my days are spent in a lab, so podcasts are always my go-to. Your chemistry and quirkiness keep me going, and I look forward to learning a little something each week from Whiskey and Wonder. Interesting coincidence. Same day I listened to your episode on Bitcoin, I found my husband doing some computer building and programming it for crypto mining. I was so giddy and thought, wow, I just learned about this and found myself blurbing all this info back to him. Keep up the good work, y'all. I look forward to many more episodes and whiskeys to try. Here are a few interesting topics. These were some of the wildest events I've ever read about. The London Beer Flood of 1814 and Boston's Great Molasses Flood of 1919. Cheers, Morgan. And she also included... Sorry, I was a little quick on the draw there. Uh, she also included a PS. Pompey says hi. Pompey is her adorable little doggo. Um, I'm going to email friend Morgan back and ask if we can post Pompey on our Instagram. Absolutely. Um, he is adorable in that photo. Yes, he is. Sweet um, so Hopefully friend Morgan will let us post Pompey. If not, just imagine a really, really, really cute dog. Wearing a Santa hat. Yes. Because he's wearing a Santa hat. It's adorable. He's wearing He's so cute. He's such a good boy. He is. Um, friend Morgan also made a donation. We want to yes. thank her as well. Um, yes. For that, as as with everybody who's made a donation, thank y'all so much. Thank um, you. It helps. It, every little bit you send us helps, um, and it'll make our podcast get better and better and better. So, thank you guys so much for your support. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I also want to say. I think we got that email just about the time I settled in to this topic this week and figured out what I wanted to do, what I wanted to research. And I was struck by the two topics that she suggested. I am very interested in both of those because they are so strange. Yes. I very yes, much I am looking forward to learning about so. them. Um, I'm sure you guys will hear one, if not both of those topics from us at some point in the future. Um, those are great ideas. So thank you, friend Morgan. Absolutely. Um, so I think as it stands now, and again, this is all up in the air as far as COVID goes, um, and taste buds and smell buds and whatnot. Um, we have one whiskey in the chamber, so to speak. Uh, two, I thought we had two. Is it only one? It's only one now. We uh, last week Woodford Reserve double yep, double yep. oaked was one of the two. Uh, so we currently yep, have one right. in the chamber. With it appears two more on deck now from our anonymous uh, email earlier, and. Uh, we should be renewing, getting our next Flaviar batch here before too long, hopefully. So yeah, we'll should have, be within the next few weeks. We'll have a good little running list to get to. Um, so we'll Once see. Once Tyler can smell again. Yeah, we're we're going to operate for now under the impression that Megan's just not going to catch it. She's not. She's, yes. Her immunity is, she's super, super, uh, da, da, Wonder Woman, not Superwoman. God damn COVID. <laughs> um, 
I am going to stay as far away from Tyler as humanly possible until it is confirmed he is no longer contagious and he has a negative test result. So until that point, Wait, we what? are going to be doing this digitally. I'm what? I don't have to get another test. I just have to wait. Once you test positive, at least based off the advice that was given to me by the people that tested me, is um, I have to meet three criteria. I have to not have a fever for 24 hours on my own, not with the aid of fever redu- redu- Tylenol. Reduce. Yeah, fever <laughs> reducers. Um, I have to be symptom free, and it has to be at least 10 days since my symptoms started. And after those three criteria are met, I am good to go back to work. I don't need another negative test. I don't need anything else. So if everything goes according to plan, I believe that is on Thursday or Friday of this week. If With you still being sick today, though, probably not. I have gotten better every single day. Um, with the, That's true. Yeah. So I think I'm going to be completely insane by next Thursday or Friday. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be symptom free. If not, I'll continue to quarantine, but I hope I am symptom free. And all those I hope other you things. are too. I haven't run the first fever yet, according to my thermometer. I think I was running a fever the other night because I was under my covers freezing cold, but I my thermometer said my temperature was 95.7, so the fuck do I know? 95.7? You run cold. Yeah, I, so since I was cold, I should have been hot. Right? Interesting. Or, or I mean, I'm thinking about that wrong. I I don't know. I would I know the average temperature is like 98.7. Yeah, and I was like 95.7. So. So. I don't know. I don't know. That's- but Regardless, my symptoms have been very mild. Um, and at this point today, the only symptom I have is the sneezy thing, the uh, watery eyes. I have not even been coughing nearly as bad as I was yesterday. The congestion in my chest is going down. So that's good. compared to the sore throat and headache and whatnot I had earlier in the week, there's a big improvement. I'm good. Well, We'll keep an eye and an ear out and make sure that you are completely healthy, though, before yep. we meet in person again. I agree. Uh, I'm nervous specifically about just two or three people um, that I am I was close to. Um, and I, I'm nervous. I gave it to them, and you were one of those people. So we'll just take it as it comes. Hopefully, I will get my test back soon, and you will see that I am fine. That's the goal. Hopefully, your chair is far enough away from me. I think so. I think it is, too. It's almost right at six feet, so. Yeah, I think think we'll be okay. Um, But I will let you know as soon as I have my results. I appreciate that. If I am positive, you're going to get your ass chewed out, so. I'm sorry. But I'm not experiencing any symptoms or anything, so I'm I'm gonna assume that I'm gonna be all right. All right, well, but you know what they say about assuming? Exactly. NASA, <laughs> I'm looking at you. Yeah, NASA. Um. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna lie. This really put a damper on wanting to work for NASA. Um, yeah, I. I mean, I get everywhere as a business, and everyone's out to make money, but that that hurt. Yeah, I. It's, I'm it's very a, disappointed. Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? I'm I'm very disappointed. Yeah, uh, and it sadly, that's something that I've come across uh, in my industry. I've worked closely with um, man, I don't want to say manufacturing, but big industry. We'll just call it a, a large, big industry. And that culture of hell where was it my notes hold on let me find it what did they say Uh, a culture of basically uh, uh, damn it COVID brain 
What do we call it, <laughs> Megan? Not compliance. Uh, it was a C. Um, I don't know what you're trying to say. P- people were just like, uh, okay, with safety. Remember when the... Complicency. Complicency. I, complacency. Yeah, that's it. I complacency, know it yeah. yeah. Whatever. Um, Same thing. Sorry. Fucking COVID brain, guys. Um, yeah, I just there, bad there is word. a complacency as far as safety goes, and most places don't want to talk about safety until... It's too late. Until it's too late. They want numbers. They want productivity. Um, doesn't matter how you get it produced until it causes an accident. And then everything's safety, 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 until it's not about safety. It's about getting it done again. And yep. that's an unfortunate... Uh, unfortunate reality. Yeah. It I is. think a lot of industries um, are like that. Yep. And, you know, it, I don't want to say it is what it is. I was going to say it is what it is, but I shouldn't say that. That's terrible. It shouldn't that be. That is terrible. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't it be like that. that. Um, so if you can make an improvement in your safety at your job or whatever industry you work in, you should definitely do that. No matter how many people you may or may not piss off. Oh, God, here comes a sneeze again. Oh, uh, bless you in advance. And yes, definitely. Um, Safety should be everyone's top priority in any business um, because, you know, money is, it's just money. It's temporary, but people's lives are irreplace, irreplaceable. Exactly. <laughs> people's lives are also temporary, but they should be temporary. They're less temporary than money. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say, but e- anyway, people are important. Money is not. Absolutely. Um, I think on that note, to everybody that supports us, you're very important. Yes, you are. We love y'all. And, 100%. Yep. And I appreciate all y'all's well wishes. Um, I am going to survive this. I am a survivor. I want to be known as a COVID survivor afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I believe in you, Tyler. Oh, yeah, I got this. I think I'm through the hardest part. But anyway, I think on that note, it's time to do a virtual cheers. Not that we even okay. quote unquote cheers anymore because we have the sound effect recorded, but you know, I can at least hold it up to the camera. I think we did that last week. I think so. Not, um, that, not that you have a camera, but I'll pretend. No, but I can pretend. I am I am cheersing to nothing. Yeah, I'd- and and that's that's how far we went, guys, to stay to make sure that I was isolated is like her camera's still here. I could have, I guess, worn gloves and gotten it and set it on the porch and she could have picked it up, but it wasn't worth the risk. You no. Know? So, no. All right. Um, well, I, thank you for the interesting topic. Um, I and hope I did it justice. I hope so too. That was a, a rough one to get through. So, yeah. Uh, emotional topic. Uh, heavy topic and high on COVID. Not a good combo. But I guess <laughs> on that note, let's uh, go ahead and do a cheers. Okay. Everybody Thank you guys so much. As always, don't drink and drive. Thank y'all so cheers. much. Thank you. Is that going to be 